Hi everyone, welcome to the Tanner Lecture. My name is Jen Farrell. I am the current chair of the Chicago Section IFT. Um, just wanna thank you all for attending. We're very excited to be able to still um, present this lecture uh, virtually. <laughs> and um, just as a couple um, little agenda items, and announcements um, before the actual um, Tanner lecture starts. Uh, just have a few uh, awards and um, introduction of our scholarship winners before we um, before we start. For those of you just joining, uh, this is our Tanner Lecture. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're very happy to have you virtually. Um, just a few announcements uh, as our presentation cycles through. Uh, we've got some really exciting events coming up, some virtual events. Um, one very creative idea from our new professionals for a virtual chocolate tasting on May 28th. Um, registration closes next week so hurry up and get your get your registration in so you can get some chocolate to taste at home uh, additionally we have a food law panel also moving to a virtual event uh, from our professional development committee and we will also uh, we're still hoping to have our golf outing we've moved it to september 15th so stay tuned for more information there um, and then keep an eye out for our suppliers night as well uh, in November. Uh, we'd also like to, um, first of all, thank our current volunteers because they've been absolutely wonderful this past year. Uh, and we are always accepting new volunteers as well, um, especially for these committees listed on the slide here. Um, we have a lot of fun, easy opportunities and um, very low time commitment, and especially for some of us busy young professionals. Um, additionally, we wanted to market the Streetelmeyer Award. If you are unemployed and you want to attend the virtual IFT, um, please feel free to um, <laughs> learn more and register for that at our website below. Thanks, Jen. Um, this is uh, Mike Carson with uh, uh, the Awards and Nominations Committee. Um, I've been told I have five minutes. I am literally starting to stopwatch now, so I don't take up too much time. Um, so, because I know you're all here for the presentation, but uh, as Jen said, we have some amazing volunteers. We are a volunteer-driven organization, and this is our night to thank them and and bring to light some uh, outstanding individuals who have uh, gone above and beyond the call of duty this year so uh, the first of which is uh, Hitesh Muryani um, uh, he's going to receive the new member award so the new member award is granted to one or two new members uh, every year um, who have who taken up the the torch and, and joined a new organization and hit the ground running um, Hitesh was a, an active recruiter and champion of the section uh, his positive attitude and tenacious demeanor or a welcome influence, um, bringing new blood and, and vigor into our organization. Um, and he's also volunteering as part of the Chicago Food Science Foundation now as well. So thank you, Hitesh. Uh, our next recipient of an award is uh, Yvonne Litwin. Um, Yvonne is the Global Key Account Manager with MirrorU NutriScience and a well-known Chicago section IFT volunteer. Um, a lot of you probably know Yvonne. She was recently concluded her three years of service as uh, the chair elect, uh, program chair, acting chair, and then um, awards and nominations chair. Um, with her guidance and stewardship, uh, she's laid the groundwork for uh, future leaders of the section. So we want to honor her with an award um, and honorarium. And our, our final award of the evening is is for John, John Ruff. Um, <clears throat> John is receiving the chair's achievement award. Uh, for outstanding accomplishments and contributions to the section. 
uh, award consists of a $250 honorarium and a plaque you'll be receiving. Um, John is currently the guest editor in chief of Food Technology Magazine and a former craft executive. But uh, this year, John, um, <clears throat> on top of having a history of dedication uh, of service to the section, um, he's he's gone and, and he's bolted our relationships with some other key organizations. And and really, uh, he's he's spent a lot of time in outreach and uh, attending local high school food science education events uh, as an industry expert and uh, kind of bringing bringing an olive branch, bringing a, an awareness to a new generation of food scientists. So thank you, John, um, and thank you to all our volunteers, and uh, we all we appreciate you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Natalie Haig. I'm part of the scholarship committee and tonight I'm excited to introduce this year's uh, scholarship recipients and recognize their commitment to education, community servants, and food science. So the Chicagoan Food Science Foundation with the support of the Chicago section IFT helps to provide scholarships to people in the Chicagoland area or residents of Illinois. So uh, this year we are able to award five scholarships, uh, $5,000 each. Our first recipient is Steven Buchholz. He is a senior at U of I. Um, they each shared a little description of how they're gonna use the funds from the scholarships. Um, so he's excited to be using the scholarship as he begins his senior year of studies in food science. And this will really help reduce the financial burden of attending a prominent university and enables him to focus on his studies, internships, and fermentation club. Um, our second recipient is Aubrey Duntman. She's a graduate student at U of I. Um, she's immensely grateful for receiving the scholarship. Above the help it will provide, it's a great reminder that hard work brings, brings great benefits. So um, the support of the scholarship not only inspires her to give um, all of her accomplishments, Sorry, this is going a little fast. Our third recipient is Eileen Forster. She's a junior at U of I. Um, again, this helps to relieve some of the financial burden of attending the college. And she's an active member of her school's food science department. And it's both humbling and motivating to be recognized for her efforts as a student and leader. Our fourth recipient is Mira Patel, a graduate student of U of I. She's honored and humbled to receive this scholarship. It's a wonderful reminder that hard work pays off and provides even more fuel towards her professional endeavors. So she hopes to make a meaningful impact in the food industry in the future, and this award strengthens hers to do so. Um, and our final recipient was AJ Taylor. He is a graduate student at U of I, and he's deeply grateful for being selected as a recipient of this year's scholarship. Um, it enables him as a food scientist by confirming his ambition and passions for food science. Being a graduate student is difficult, but rewarding experience. And thanks to the Chicago section IFT, he's able to pursue his dreams as a food scientist. And thank you to all the selection committee and all the donors for this award. Thank you everyone that also helped to be a juror and uh, screen through the scholarships as well. Good evening, my name is John Boudin and I will be serving as your host tonight as we go through the Tanner Lecture. I first want to start off and kind of talk a little bit about the Tanner Lecture. The, the, the Chicago Section IFT established the, Fre the Fred Tanner Lectureship in 1960 to advance the profession and practice of food science by bringing the section outstanding scientific persons in this field or its related sciences to speak on recent advances in the formulation, processing, preservation, packaging, distribution, preparation, nutritional quality, and enjoyment of food. Fred Wilbur Ta Tanner was an American food scientist, microbiologist, and a professor at the University of Illinois who served in the founding of the Institute of Food Technologists and was one of the founder and one of the editors for the scientific journal Food Research, now called the Journal of Food Science. Dr. Tanner served as IFT president from 1945 to 46 and was the author of more than 150 publications in microbiology and public health and would go on to win the Stephen Babcock Award, now called the Babcock Heart Award, and was posthumously awarded the Pasteur Award. 
I think what a lot of people don't realize about Dr. Tanner, one of his meaningful contributions is, is that he wrote the first food microbiology book that was widely used in universities to teaching food microbiology course. So it is through, it is honoring Dr. Tanner that, that we are presenting tonight the 58th Fred Tanner Lecture Series. There's been a number of uh, prominent people that, that have served on, that have presented this lecture. And tonight, we bring to you Dr. John Spink, who's PhD Director of the Food Fraud Initiative and Assistant Professor of Supply Chain Management in the Eli Broad Business College at Michigan State University. It truly is a privilege to have someone of Dr. Spink's caliber uh, presenting to us tonight and goes with the long alumni of the past lectures of the Tanner Lecture. So, so with that, um, I would like to remind people that this presentation is being recorded. You may view the presentation at our website later this week. Any questions, please type those in on the side. I will serve as the uh, moderator or the host during the talk. And uh, with that, I'll be keeping track on, on the questions and uh, be conversing back and forth with uh, Dr. Spink. So with that, I have the honor of introducing Dr. Spink to talk about food fraud prevention, trends update, and building your optimal team. Well, thank you, everybody. First off, I want to make sure that you can see my screen all right and the volume's fine. Yeah, I, I, I can hear it fine. I don't okay, know that uh, others others can jump in if they want to put a question in the in the line and stuff like that. So I might hear, see some on here that's uh, responding that it's all good. So please That's continue. great. Well, everybody, uh, IFT has been a great partner for me and for us, and uh, it's been great to interact and learn more about the Tanner Lecture uh, as moving forward. So it's an honor to to be here and, and to take it take a moment to kind of reflect back on, you know, a number of years of, of work. Um, my I, I worked for Chevron for 12 years before coming back to industry or coming back to academia uh, in 2005, and in 2009 I finished my PhD. So I've been at uh, this idea of uh, you know, anti-counterfeiting product fraud prevention uh, since since 2009 as a faculty member and probably three or four years before that. So this is really an interesting time to look back at at a lot of these uh, a lot of these concepts and things that are that are, are going on. So um, food fraud is a topic. If you know me at all, that that's that's what I cover. Uh, my wife would say every day, all day. Um, and so that and really the focus has been more on prevention along the way. And so we're going to give you an overall update trying to trends update but then the focus here was going beyond that to see what's next what's happening now at, at the front end of this uh, in companies and then really building your optimal team because that's what's happening now um, so something just as a, as a change for me um, as of as of last September I moved to our business college and that actually in a university moving around like I have is, is really uh, not very common and to move into a business college is really not done at all but but as we've seen over the years is Food fraud has become, a, 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 it's moved through a lot of different sciences as we're looking at the basics. And it's now becoming just a standard operating procedure for, for monitoring the entire company. And supply chain management includes procurement as well as logistics and operations. And so sometimes we think of supply chain as only moving the product or storing and moving it. But when you add in procurement, um, the supplier management, then it, it's an absolute uh, direct fit. So it's been phenomenal to step back and really work on the most basic levels of introduction to supply chain and introduction to procurement. So we'll cover the overall topics. So first off, I'm not going to go through the details, but this is for people that are reading it or want later or want to uh, make sure that I'm, I'm covering the topic. So you can, you can hold me to it later, but that was a summary. And then a little bit about me. But we'll get into the presentation. Um, first, overall, of, of the way that we look at at the business and, and the research is, is this combination of research, education, and outreach. So even, even talking on the phone earlier today and, and when we were planning this conference, um, really, um, I, I learned new things because everything's changing. My, oh, my gosh, is everything changing um, with us, uh, with the pandemic? Um, supply chain disruptions, food is, is become a critical infrastructure like it's never been considered before. And we're learning a lot about that. And that's leading this outreach into understanding new concepts and it goes into our, into research itself. Uh, first off, the, the, um, the, the, the focus of my <laughs> maybe, maybe five solid years there was this textbook on, on food fraud prevention. Um, so that's, that was published last October. And then another way that we communicate and the kind of products and services, how we get to the marketplace, 
are our MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses. These are actually all being redeveloped right now um, and so should be back up live and, and uh, revamped shortly. So we have four of them that are our basics, um, the overview, audit guides, and then into the vulnerability assessment. And then we also do other types of training and education along the way. And then we have on our website, we have a lot of other information uh, and you can find find it there. So, so, so Dr. Spink, if you go back to the previous slide, if you're starting new in the uh, food fraud area and you want to get started, you, you've listed a number of resources. Where would you say to start with this? Is just get to dipping your toes in the water and to start digging in further? Yeah, so that's a great question. And, and it was about uh, 2012 when we started to work on the MOOC concept, the Massive Open Online Course. And um, that's when, when we, we were asked to really develop this overview. So it was companies that were trying to build capacity and capabilities. And that's something I'll hit at the very end about your optimal team. And, and one of the big keys is, is, is the expertise of the staff. So these are basically, they're two, uh, two two-hour webinars a piece, so they're short, um, but you can move through them pretty quickly. And so that overview gives you that, that again, very, very broad overview on, on the topic itself into introducing prevention. And then the audit guides are both there because we, we're judged by getting audited uh, or auditing someone. So that's getting to introduce us to what's really required from that standpoint. And then the vulnerability assessment and prevention strategy really gets you into doing those those overviews. So we go deep there. And at that point, you've got this broad um, broad perspective. And then then there's, there's gonna be more types of training or education to go deeper there. The textbook is 700 pages long plus, and it's it's extremely comprehensive and so that's a great as a even as a desk reference so if you're starting to look at some different aspect of uh um, first sale doctrine of of product sales and things like that you might you would find that as a reference there so great question thank you um also i'd say on on a website we've got a lot of, of blog posts and overview information there um just a little bit of history when looking at the tanner concept of you know, building a foundation, and that's something that um, it started out as just just trying trying to trying to find a way in the marketplace, uh, or trying to find a way as an academic, um, and and really really kept being a, again a ten year immersion in the topic. So um, the real first key for us was at the very top is defining the public health threat of food fraud. So it was 2011, and it was actually uh, working with now Dr. Everstein at, uh, at at University of Minnesota and others is that we were starting to work on this topic of food fraud. And I think we were spending about half of our time either in a grant or article trying to explain what it is and it's a real thing. And that was really challenging. And then we kind of joked and said that we should write an article defining it. And then we thought, well, why not? Why not try that? So 2011. Now we didn't we didn't create the term or the definition, but but this was the first academic research that focused on food fraud as a term and a concept. So it was the focus of a scholarly definition, and that was that was the real starting point. And then some other things that that have have been key for me is really looking into public policy, and that's uh, something uh, working with Chris Elliott at Queen's University Belfast. I'm a visiting uh, researcher there. Looking at broadly at public policy, that was a real key because that also uh, interacted in with the UK and the EU. And then in the bottom right was was with GMA um, and, and, and looking at um, really this, the terminology. And there was a time there where there was a lot, there's a wide range of, of concepts that were being um, worked on um, you know, how does it relate to food defense, things like that, food protection. And so that was a key, a key, um, a key research project, especially because it was, it was GMA uh, with the Grocery Manufacturers Association. And that then also was a survey to their membership. And the bottom left was interesting. I got invited to a, a, a WHO, uh, the InfoSan Foods uh, Conference um, in Singapore. And there was a lot of questions there of if or what should WHO's role be in food fraud and food fraud prevention. And there was a lot of debate of whether WHO or FAO should deal with it at all. And so that's where we did this, this survey of members. And it was 95 plus percent of the, of the member countries. The key, uh, the key um, lead for each country said that they wanted more help, that they definitely wanted InfoSan and WHO to focus on this. And also they wanted help. 
And that all then came together and really, really for me was the, the culmination into a overall, you know, holistic textbook. So it's got supply chain, it's got enterprise risk management, it's got criminology, it's got, you know, supply chain security, it's got the whole, the range of things, a deep dive into, into risk management. So I think this is, this is what we've seen with this broad, we, uh, there's now a broad foundation. So we all have a, a starting point and we are by no means the only scholars in this space. There's a lot of people that are doing an awful lot of work around the world, and that's really been fantastic to see to see the, the field really grow. Also, something that was was um, uh, really key is this this this, this really intense um, desire and effort to collaborate. So in, in 2017 was a, was a big year publishing for us, and we had 18 co-authors. That is probably three times. What, um, what most three or times or more of most of my, of my colleagues have, but we've been looking to really, really reach out. So if you're a researcher in the space, please continue along the way. But that's why I think that's how I think we get this this broad concept, um, really, really widely uh, well known and um, um, implemented in the marketplace. So to give you a very, very brief overview, um, it, it, there was a maybe it was about two years ago or so I stopped uh, including this overview. Uh, in in some of my presentations, and then uh, actually was asked, reminded by people to to definitely keep keep at least using a little bit of this to give a good foundation at the starting point. Because even though some of us have been working on this for ten or plus years, there's a lot of people who haven't. So it's important to just have again a brief a brief overview. So at at the very beginning, defining food fraud, in the broadest sense, it's intentional deception for economic gain using food. Now this is an intentionally broad definition and intentionally simple because it is holistic. Now, this definition is consistent with the Global Food Safety Initiative, the European Commission, EU, UK, ISO, and others. In the US, uh, maybe maybe less less so now, but we've we've uh, had this the, um, the, 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 the subcategory of economically motivated adulteration. And we say a subcategory because EMA is a substance for economic gain, not dealing with all types of, of food fraud. And that is defined by FDA in their, their working definition still. Um, we'll cover more of the regulations later real briefly. Um, now, key is it's, we need to look at the motivation. We're trying to prevent food fraud. The goal is not to catch food fraud. The goal is to prevent it from occurring in the first place. So that's why we need to look at, at the uh, at the motivation, and the motivation is economic gain, and it's gain for themselves, They're not trying to harm anybody else. In the broader sense of an intentional act or unintentional act, food fraud would definitely be intentional. Originally, it got classified under or with food defense, but then food defense evolved a bit where the motivation was traditionally harm or terror, and then beyond that, after 2009, 2011, when, the, when FISMA came out, and then specifically when the Food Safety Modernization Act intentional adulteration rule came out, um, FDA narrowed their focus of food defense to wide-scale human health harm. Something really important to point out and remind us is that there's always an economic threat. There's not always a public health threat. And that's why there hasn't been intense focus on this for the last 200 years or so. Um, because when there was a public health threat, it got, it, it got the focus of the government and the public health agencies, such as FDA. But when the public health threat went away, then it really moved to a different agency and had a different set of priorities. The key is there's always a vulnerability. And that's where industry came in, specifically the Global Food Safety Initiative, to really uh, identify this as something that they needed to deal with. A key here is the term vulnerability. And when we get into supply chain management, supply chain disruptions, and criminology, the difference between risk and vulnerability is really important. Because a risk is, has a probabilistic risk assessment with it of some kind, a likelihood and a consequence. There's a real estimate of the outcome. And, and after risk treatment, you would have some type of statistical difference. A vulnerability is a system weakness. You don't need to have any more information than knowing that you left your front door unlocked to know that there was a vulnerability. That's where we can focus most simply. And that's where I think the food fraud research really moved forward when it looked at vulnerabilities instead of really those risks. Uh, specifically. A lot of examples we won't go into now. I'll mention at the bottom is a glossary term, so that thing keeps growing. It was originally a, a glossary for a presentation like this, um, and it was maybe a page or two, and it kept growing to 350 words was the first publication, and this and a uh, later version has got over 950 words. Basically, every time we find another document or report that deals with related terms, we put them all together. So there's a, there's a, a central place to really look at that, the glossary of terms. One, one quick question. Dr. Sure. Spink, is, 
is looking at your looking at the, your previous slide with some of those definitions that are on there or some of these quick examples these are all where say a company is is doing some sort of, of fraud um does does the definition of fraud could that be expanded to say someone within a company that might be doing something uh that could be fraud where they're personally benefiting and maybe taking advantage of their organization that's that's a real key. Um, I didn't get into it here in more detail, but when we look at the types of criminals or the types of counterfeiters, we where there's a really specific uh, field of study to look that looks at this in the criminology field. But that's a real key: is that it could be an enterprise that decides they're going to be a criminal enterprise, or someone at the higher levels make that decision. But then it could be an occupational type of criminal is someone within their organization, within their place of employment, they find some way to commit the fraud. That could be a, dr a delivery driver that swaps out high priced with low price scotch or meat or things like that. Could be a, pl a plant manager that doesn't use enough high priced ingredient to make the plant operations uh, look like they're running uh, you know, at, at a at a higher higher margins could be a purchasing agent that's that's getting paid to accept lower quality product. Could be anybody along the supply chain, and that's a real key. Is that we look at this, we're we're trying to understand when we find an incident. The most important part at the beginning, strategically, is to understand why someone did it. Why did they think it was a good idea that to to commit this fraud act, and how did they do it? And then after that, we look at where where they they did commit it, you know, with with their uh, the how, and then try to put plans in place that specifically meet their um, their their modus operandi. Example is if if an employee is stealing product out of the back of a warehouse, then you could do different things like lock the back door or have a video camera on the back door, and so that video camera may then you may monitor it only once a month, but if you find the product has been stolen, you could go back to the records. And, and monitor to see who was there. Now you might say maybe they have a hood on and you can't see them. Well, then you could also add a camera in the parking lot to see someone walk into their car. Now, now you could start to find ways to, to deter them. And the key with that is it's not someone walking in off the street, that's, that's, an, that's employee theft. So, so it could be anybody in the supply chain at all. And I would say that it has, it has been everybody <laughs> at one point in the supply chain, um, someone has been tempted to, to commit the, the crime. Was that clear in the in the response there? Oh yeah, yes, thank you. Good. Okay, yeah, that's great. Any questions are are great to get in here. So when we we think about food fraud, it's occurred th since the beginning of all commerce, probably, <laughs> um, and and there's back to uh, you know uh, 1000 BCE. Um, there there's reports of it of it occurring all the way through to the future. But for us, when we're looking at prevention, we really should be looking at exactly what's happening now and and why it became a big focus. And so we look at these, quote, modern food fraud incidents. And the first one that we really see that started things out for us was 2000, about 2004, when Sudan Red, the carcinogen colorant, was found in, in spices like paprika and others. And this is an adulterant substance that was put in to make it look brighter, redder. And it still shows up every once in a while, not in the massive scale that we saw in the past. But this raised the awareness that there could be something out there. There could be a problem of some kind that that's more than just an annoyance. It was something that we could we could find and it was causing things like recalls. And then of course, 2007, this is where food fraud really became a, a hot topic and melamine was in infant formula and pet food. And this was terrifying for everybody. Um, and to think of melamine shouldn't have been in product in any appreciable amount because it's, it's, it's a plasticizer, help, helps make bottles uh, soft. Um, so, so that was a real key for us, but not a lot happened at that point. Later, the Global Food Safety Initiative specifically got worried about this topic and started a food fraud think tank. I was one of four people on it and eventually were six that were giving um, a review and guidance to, to the board. And in the middle of that, while we were in the middle of our, 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 our studies, horse meat occurred. And at this point then, since there was already a focused study on this within GFSI, when horse meat occurred, the, the board was, was really, um, really concerned. And this then led this to be something that really had to be dealt with. And that's when we'd say that, that food fraud was really uh, bo born at that point because um, it, there, was a, there was a group we're looking at it that had a connection to the laws and regulations. And, and that's where it really, it, 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 and, um, it impacted and to, us. And, and to that point, the horse meat never happened in the US. This was largely a European issue, isn't that right? Well, let's say that the, the incidents that they found were we're all all in, in the UK uh, or in in, in Europe. Um, I would say that you know occasionally we find um, um, 
species swapping uh, around the world and in almost uh, almost any market. But yes, tradition really the, what they saw is the big incidents were specifically within a couple of the supply chains uh, there there in Europe. That's true. Um, and thing was is when people started testing, there was this question of well, what else could be in there? Well, how didn't we know about this? Because these are really formalized, um, very high tech, high quality, um, food safety um, focused supply chains. And this is really, um, there's a sense of violation to think about this, that this could, this, this could occur like that. Through that and later, there's been an endless stream of, of incidents that are now classified as food fraud. And that's a real key as well, is that now when something comes out, it's referred to as food fraud. It's not just a food contaminant or food safety issue or things like that. It's now food fraud. And we saw there in 2014, you know, the ground peanut shells to extend cumin and then ongoing. There's a lot of different ones and, and they just keep going. The most recent one, a big major one was the organic grain fraud schemes. Um, $140 million in, in mislabeling. So we're now realizing that this is not just a, 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 a one-off activity. Um, it's something that really does need to be focused on. And fortunately now we have those laws and regulations uh, from, from GFSI. Um, just to define food fraud in relation to the other food risks. We were working in the area of food safety and food defense. And then when we looked at the motivation and the root cause, we found that food fraud was fundamentally different. And we then expanded, expanded this to look at food quality because food quality could be those things that are accidental that occur or other types of supply chain disruptions uh, that do cost a company money. They are, they are risk. On, on the left side here, the action is unintentional. Bad guys don't try to create these, these or, or people don't try to create these problems. On the right, that's intentional. The bad guys know what they're doing. Then we need to get to the motivation if we're trying to get to the root cause. For food defense, the motivation is harm, public health, economic, or terror. Now, FDA focuses on the public health harm, but the rest of the government, FBI and others, focus on all harms. And for food fraud, the motivation is economic gain, and that's gain for themselves. So a disgruntled employee that puts sand in a or a contaminant in a, in a fill line, they're trying to harm the company, not make money for themselves. And that's a real key. At that point, we're now looking at a human adversary, and we make the leap over to criminology because the biological organism in question is not a microbe, or we go to microbiology. The biological organism in question is a human, so we go to social science. And then food defense is wide-scale harms, just to make sure to emphasize that there. So then from our research and looking kind of at the Tanner approach to the, to the big picture, is that starting to look at this, we worked from the problem outwards and was really working with industry, trying to figure out what they need to do, how they need to assess it. And so we looked at the science and sciences of food fraud prevention. And at the very beginning was food safety. So melamine in infant formula in pet food, it was a food safety incident. We needed to find it, get it out of the system. There was a bit of food authenticity testing that went on there to look for purity as well. But that's really catching, catching the bad guys, not preventing it yet. And that led us one step up to look at then the to criminology. So I actually moved from the School of Packaging in College of Ag into the School of Social or the Social Science, College of Social Science and Criminology. So for four years, I was a faculty member there, really focused on the situational crime prevention, the, 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 the fundamentals of crime, looking at the types of criminals. But at that point, we just defined the root cause, but didn't have any overall structure for how to look at it or manage it within an industry. That's where then standards and certifications came in. And originally, that was 2009, I worked with International Standards Organization on product fraud before moving more to food with GFSI, and that also includes public policy. But with food fraud, when it wasn't a big public health threat or wasn't normal or traditional or really defined, it didn't get as much public policy focus at the beginning. It really got that, that industry focus. But at that point, then we've now got this structure where we had no way to define the risk or how much is enough is really what it is. Resource allocation decision making. That's when expanded to enterprise risk management. And early on when I was at Chevron, I was a product manager and worked for a general manager at Chevron and he was in charge of about a billion dollars. And so we really did get into these issues of trying to figure out which risks are the worst ones, which ones should we work on. So now we've gone through these different sciences and sciences, through food to social science to business. And the final stage here of what we've got going on, and for me specifically, is shifting to supply chain management. This is now becoming integrated into just the common practices of how do you do supplier uh, risk assessments, uh, supply chain disruptions, um, and ongoing monitoring along the way. So that's how we've moved, moved through the, the process. And as a break here, if, if there's any questions to, to tee me up for any of those, um, right now, I'm not 
seeing any that are any questions that that are on here. So one 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 of the questions is kind of a teaser as you go through this is if uh, someone has their SQF audit and uh, any pearls of wisdom that you can provide along the way that they ace that part of the uh, SQF audit when that comes through. Okay. Well, I'd like to. I'd love to hear that from people, but but also um, that's something that we we definitely look at, and we'll we'll be we'll be getting to that point and and uh, building up to that specifically. So I'll make sure to to mention that when we're looking at at scoping it, and that's when that's that's a key segue into the food fraud prevention trends, and part of the trends are driven by nonconformity and by well conformity or nonconformity. What are the goals of GFSI? I was I was actually e emailing with some GFSI uh, board members earlier about you know looking at different industries to work with. And that's what we're starting to, we're learning more every day, every week. And so the trends that we see overall is this natural evolution. I mean, we look back at things like sustainability when they started, quality when it started. Um, I don't know if you remember a number of years ago was uh, uh, um, um, workplace safety, um, um, the repetitive stress injuries, things like that. There's a natural evolution as concepts are implemented into standard operating procedures. And first is what we saw with food fraud is people look to expand their current programs. They already had food safety. They said, we got this, we're just gonna expand food safety. Then they realized that it was getting complex and they needed to do some type of separate vulnerability assessment. That was a big a big shift. And then, the real, then realizing they needed specific countermeasures. So these aren't just food safety countermeasures, you know, additional testing in that sense. Even you had to look outside the supply chain. And then, look, then there was this move to this holistic food fraud prevention strategy. So what I mean by that is a company then had a separate strategy. And I'd say it's been about the, over the last three years, uh, as companies have moved forward, depending on their, their scale or their, their, their progress, is they've, they've realized they really needed to implement it. It's one thing to have a piece of paper that says it's a strategy. It's another for it to be implemented. Now what we're seeing, like with the shift to supply chain management in, into more supply chain standards or business standards, is a management system. And that's been a realization, I would say over the last year, 18 months, is companies that were at the front end of this, that have been very progressive, realized that they were really still only maybe product specific, maybe only ingredient specific ingredients coming in or specific types of ingredients, that really an overall management system was needed. And that'd be the focus through the, through the end of this presentation is looking at how you build that system up. And, and who's on that team? What's the optimal team? And the optimal team, you know, assigning the team is based on your unique fraud opportunity. If you have mostly stolen goods or counterfeits in the market, rather than uh, um, adulterated or, or diluted ingredients coming in, that's a very, those are very, very different fraud opportunities. Some companies have a very low fraud opportunity. Some have a very high. Next is the unique risk tolerance. So it's unique fraud opportunity, unique risk tolerance. So every company does have a different level of comfort with risk. And people say, oh, we're low risk. Well, you're low risk of, for doing stupid things. <laughs> but if you're in the food industry, you do accept a lot of risk. Um, and that's something that, that, that people kind of don't realize until they re really think about it. Like how, how much of an audit do you need to do before you accept a supplier to be an approved supplier? Those are things that would be a, a type of risk tolerance. And the final piece of this is specific resource capabilities and capacity. That's where the training comes in as well, because if you're going to add 10 people to your food fraud prevention team, you have to figure out, well, how are they going to learn the topic? There's not very many food fraud experts out there on every single topic, every single aspect of it. I'm not an expert, expert on every aspect of it, and I've studied this for 10 years. So we've got to find a way to, to build people up um, in, in those, those specific areas. So the, the management system and the function and the structure of that is based on those, those people themselves. So before we get along and look at what that scope should be, it's good to give a reminder of the food fraud compliance requirements and dates. First off, GFSI. GFSI was required as of January 2018. So you're supposed to have this all in place way back then, fully functioning. And I've got a 10, 10, question, 10 yes or no questions to make it simple for you. But a key with GFSI is you wouldn't actually be GFSI certified, but you'd be certified to a food safety standard that is endorsed by GFSI. So GFSI is the foundation. It could be, like you said, uh, SQF but, and, and others. And the GFSI members represent approximately 65% of the world trade. So, and they're usually in the manufacturers or the retailers. So that's uh, emphasizing that for product to get through the supply chain, you really do need to meet these compliance requirements. And the requirements are a vulnerability assessment and a prevention strategy. 
Now, at this point, early on in those GFSI documents, there's not a lot of detail yet because we're very early in the process still. January 2018 is not that long ago when you're looking at, at implementing an entire standard. A key is that no documents equal an audit nonconformance. If you cannot convince an auditor or a company, when they a, a customer when they come to visit, that you have a, 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 a prevention strategy in place, if you can't show them the documents, you can get an audit nonconformity. Why that's important is that no certification, no sales, or at least a lot of explaining, because this is the Global Food Safety Initiative. And that's a key. If you lose your certification for based on food fraud, there's not a food fraud add-on or bolt-on or extra. It's about all of food safety. That, that's a, that's a really, really important. And there's a lot of suppliers or customers, uh, forgive me, customers who have two, are two tracks for suppliers. One are that, that are GFSI compliant and one that are soon to be GFSI compliant. There's no not GFSI compliant. But really stepping back, FISMA, since 2016, it was actually required to have can, conduct in a hazard analysis. And here it is in 21 CFR, the hazard analysis must be written regardless of its outcome. What this means is if you think that stolen goods aren't a problem for you, not a concern, that's okay, but you still have to have an analysis. And a key there is that it does point out that one of the, the three points is hazard may be intentionally introduced for the purposes of economic gain. So clearly it does, it does fit in there and you really would need to have this assessment to be compliant. Now, will an FDA inspector or inspector or in an audit ask questions like this? Maybe not, but if you do have a problem, if you have fraud, this is something where you could, it could end up uh, being identified as, as illegal activity. And really back to 1938, the two sections on adulterated foods and misbranded foods, food fraud has been illegal since at least then. So really the thing is you might as well just get started on it because um, you have to do it for GFSI and you really need to do it for everything else. So that would lead us into looking at, at what we actually do. Um, so so, so yes. with, that, with that being said, the, the simple question on here is, is with the GFSI and the FISMA preventative controls, the, these have been around a little bit right now. Uh, it seems like the you know, GFSI scheme, that, that's updated rather regularly. Where do you see that some of these uh, going in the future for say, whether it's a GFSI audit or with the FISMA preventative controls? Do you, do you think that there's gonna be additional things that, that are in the works that, that we should at least be thinking about to uh, put into our plans right now? Yeah, I, what, what we see is, um... Uh, you know, if you if you had another another about four hours, I could be I could go into more detail. But but when you look at audit, uh, the audit nonconformities, to look at what what's gone wrong for people in audits, and it was it was two years ago at the food safety summit when they announced they um, uh, some of the auditors were talking about that that at the top was was uh, demonstrate implementation, because people had the plans but they 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 hadn't implemented them. They couldn't demonstrate that they'd been implemented. And that's where we see the auditors along the way are finding the next set of questions to ask. And the key is that leap to have your strategy and implement it and into a management system. A management system doesn't mean that you have to be doing a lot. You just have to have a regular process. So a question might be, you know, with, with COVID-19, um, as an auditor, I might ask, um, well, what, what did you see as in, did you see any new types of, of, of issues that came up? And what was your process to look at those issues? What was your method? How did you assess them? When did you realize you needed to do something or not? That's a management system. And it's really simple. Go look at your food safety management system, HACCP, or quality management. Use those same methods, techniques to, to apply just to the, the food fraud question. That's the thing that we see is this, this real shift to a management system. Now, a real key along the way is that if we show we as a food producers or retailers, if we show that there are assessments being conducted, so let's go back and look at FISMA, as you said. So the hazard analysis must be written regardless of its outcome. So there's now a standardized body of work that people build upon, the GFSI type, type work. There's a lot of research going on about what's a good vulnerability assessment, what are tools, what are information to fill those, that, that, those assessments. So now if FDA would look at this, they would say, well, hazard analysis, well, there is, there's a common practice. And then written regardless of its outcome, if you are already doing this assessment for GFSI, then you are, you're already doing that. And then, then basically FISMA says it covers anything that could lead to a health hazard. So that's everything in the world. <laughs> um, and so I think that the, from a government standpoint, whether it's in the, the EU, China, or here, it's basically uh, just demonstrating implementation, which goes right back to the biggest question and concern from, from GFSI. So I think what, it, what we're looking at is really to take a fundamental approach to the management system 
And that's a real that's a real key to that. Actually, it's a great segue. The management system then says, okay, if, if it's in a company in a management system, then how does that connect in the company? And next one that I was going to actually cover, so you, you teed it up perfectly, is, is how do companies, what are companies' requirements for things like financial reporting? And under Sarbanes-Oxley, 2002 and 2007, uh, risks to revenue are disclosed or confirmed to be managed. This is a government law. It's a regulation required for all public companies. And that that's a real key that this is not optional. So the, the overall vulnerability assessments or this initial screen can fit right in to the overall um, management system of the entire company. Now we're showing this, this entire integration and that that's a real key to the big picture. Also a key is that this is becoming a customer supplier quality and safety expectation. So more and more uh, retailers are asking companies to show them their vulnerability assessment and prevention strategy. Doesn't need to be very detailed, but that just gets it started. When we're looking at GFSI, a question is, it's, oh, some people say, oh, it's just a checkbox. Yes and no, put it, scribble something on a piece of paper. Well, the question that we get here is, is, is beyond that question, is it okay for this stage right now? Well, it's one thing to be January 2018, 2019, 2020, when we get to 2021. But for this stage right now, just asking a series of yes or no questions about doing these activities, it is absolutely a great way to start because the formal and official process has started. What we mean by that is that, that, that an auditor asks the yes or no question, have you conducted a vulnerability assessment? And then when, when you ask a company, you tell a company you're gonna ask that question, series of events that occurs and they go back and they have to develop those documents and these go to compliance these go to the cfo or others the, the legal general counsel and they start to look at this process and really say what should we have in place that's what we want to have happen at the start so if you're a retailer tell your suppliers that you're going to be asking them these questions and you expect them to have it in place if you're a manufacturer tell your ingredient suppliers you expect these to be in place now the key is that they get started the first one is going to be very simple of course as it was for quality as it was for sustainability it's a natural evolution you don't build HACCP is over 25 years old you didn't get the plan you have now 25 years ago it built and expanded we were starting the process and that process so, so, is 10 questions so, so, so yeah, a question that came up is uh, apart from a reputable supplier with a valid third-party audit what would you recommend as some things to evaluate for packaging fraud, specifically items with primary packaging? D packaging is, is difficult. Actually, my PhD is in packaging, so I have, I have a very a special relationship with, with packaging. For the most part, um, you know, the, making pack packages is, is really pretty complex. Um, a key is uh, every product, every Every product, every ingredient has the same set of questions. Now, when you go through the questions, you still do an analysis to say what could go wrong, you know, in what, what, where could fraud occur? And at least you've got a methodical way to start answering those questions. So we really, every time I get a question about, um, well, even COVID-19, so what should we worry about? My first question is, well, have you, you know, show me your vulnerability assessment. You know, have you, have you entered these new concerns in your vulnerability assessment? Or how is this how is this impacted on your corporate risk map or your 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 categories of risks? And if someone doesn't have a method in place, then you're really just guessing. You think you should do something, but you don't have a process in place. So so let's take that packaging question and go back to it. Let's actually we'll apply that question right here. So these are the ten most basic questions. And if you can say yes to all of them, then most likely you are your GFSI fully compliant. So let's ask this of a packaging company. So have you conducted a vulnerability assessment? just a vulnerability assessment. And if they haven't conducted one, well, that right there is a key starting point for them that they should do an assessment. And, and an assessment for a packaging company would be look at the, the types of, of attributes of the package. Is it, a, is it a high barrier package? Is it got some specialty uh, um, you know, components to it? And then, then to check the performance of that. But you'd first do a vulnerability assessment. And the next question is, is it written? And there's a lot of times where someone says, oh, we've, oh yeah, we've done all these assessments, but they're not really comfortable handing it over to show you to say, hey, this is this is a competent assessment. So doing the assessment first, having it written. Then I'd ask that company, do you have a, you know, show me your food fraud prevention strategy. And at that point, they they if they're asking those basic questions and haven't done an assessment, then they probably haven't done a strategy either. And is it written? Now these all start with a blank piece of paper pretty much. And let's let's say you know a packaging company that makes a simple film that goes to a, a food company, a question would really be about those those base materials or any type of 
again, performance of the package, sealing, you know, sealing is a is an important attribute of the package. And if they use less of the of the materials uh, for that that to, to form that seal, that that could be a, a fraud opportunity. Um, also, with with packaging, could be that it's food grade and it stays food grade. But then we move through is if once you have that strategy, is to look at demonstrate implementation. So I'm just saying, can you demonstrate it? Can you show me? I don't know a agenda, <laughs> a meeting plan, um, um, just anything that shows that you've you've met more than once on this executive executive level sign off. So it's one thing for a small team to do this, but it's another when when a VP signs off. The reason why that's important is because then an executive of the company is saying, I bless this and say it's something that is competent and thorough and I've reviewed it and it meets my standards. A lot of times people start the process and then when it has to go to executive level sign off to go to chief compliance officer, general counsel or others, there's a whole lot more focus. And that's what we, we just want the company itself. It's not that people are just trying to do the minimum. This is to protect all companies in their own level of, of practice and then minimally conduct an annual food fraud incident review. So even with that package company to say, um, have you done, and do you have you reviewed annually any things that could, that have gone wrong? Um, and then do you have a method to do that? A method being once a quarter, we look at something, it doesn't need to be complex. And then the final two that have been the biggest uh, hurdle for, for companies, especially early on was, does it cover all types of food fraud? So there's been a couple major food companies that um, when they when they got to the, the point of, of an, an audit that they didn't cover things like stolen goods and they got an audit and then addressing all products all the way through from ingredients to, to finished goods in the marketplace most times food safety is really looking at internal controls inside the manufacturing or to uh, the suppliers and so um, that's been that's been an area that's been been missed so this basic set of questions is a great starting point for, for anybody um, whether it's a packaging company or or a traditional food ingredient company so when we look at putting it together, even for that packaging company, we'll use them as the example still, is usually what we see is there's been a lot of uh, activities that have been kind of these programs that have kind of come off one off, um, depending on one problem. It's time to put it all into one strategy and to look at how they all interact. Because when you're dealing with in one area, you're gaining some insight on another area. And that's the strategy piece. That that's really understanding how these programs, the visibility, the transparency, um, you can get a real, you can get a lot of benefits um, if you start to look at the the information together. And that's that's the the very starting point. And then overall, looking at at how we how we uh, manage the the systems themselves. And this is the part where we get into the actual. Uh, um, focus on optimizing your team itself. So around the outside, this was an article that we wrote. Um, it, it looks at the academic disciplines and the fundamental concepts. And the goal on the right is the guardian. The goal, goal is to protect our system. And now we say, well, how, what would we do in between there? So we we'll call this the food fraud prevention cycle. So it starts there on the left with information coming in. That's one type of task. The next task is really looking at and assessing the fraud opportunity. Second type of task. Third is conducting the assessments. Then you always need to calibrate this with your unique risk tolerance. And that's looking at, at, your, at this risk in relation to all other products that you make. And then there's a final rank. And the rank is important because that helps you evaluate countermeasures. How much is enough? Should you audit a company once a month, once a year, once every 10 years? Never. <laughs> that's where now you, have, you can have a real, a real um, focus on that assessment. In the middle is the, is the fraud opportunity. That's the driver for everything. That's criminology at its core. Now, when we look at these other attribute aspects, they, I mean, one person could run the whole process, or it could be one person at each of these at the, each of these steps. Within those steps are some other activities, such as initial screening and detailed assessment. You start at a very high level. That's very much CFO um, enterprise risk management to start very high level and go deeper. So there's specific work processes there. There's articles, scholarship on that. Then even with information coming in, you look at current incidents, you look at scanning, such as at databases, other types of incidents, and public policy. So if all of a sudden the Canadian government's going to look at uh, Michigan cherries more closely, then um, that's something that's new information that could lead to more of a focus or more of a fraud opportunity. And then countermeasures. So a lot of times we jump ahead to do an assessment and then picking countermeasures without having the rest of the management system to help us calibrate, again, how much is enough. How much is enough for traceability? for audits or inspections. I mentioned that as well, and also for things like testing. Now we, there's a management system. Now, when you look at optimizing your team, 
you look at each of these each of these as a specific type of activity and then you look at work processes within that activity so now there's a management system so overall when we look at this we now then step back to look at compliance so we'll go back and look at the required documents for food fraud and from gfsi the first one is a vulnerability assessment and here we show a, a, a case study that's a corporate risk map and on the right is a food fraud prevention strategy and you show things like a cycle management system we recommend that, that people start out very simply with those 10 questions but then write a one-page summary of both of these and that's great internally to have that but also great for an auditor because this shows this shows that you've got things organized and in one spot um, now sometimes the auditor doesn't need to go any deeper but but at least you, you want to give them confidence that you've got a plan in place, that you've got a management system and you follow it. If you, you don't really, even at arm's length looking at this, you don't know what it is, but on the left, you'll see that there's some process. There's, there's, there's a ranking system, red, orange, yellow, green, blue. And on the right, you can't really understand what it is, but you know that there's a method. And so that's showing the, the implementation. And then, then at this point, you're defining you know, what, what type of people need to be on the team and what are their specific actions. Just before moving on to some of those steps, two other documents we recommend are one, to have a one-page summary of a food fraud policy. This demonstrates and explains where in your company it's required to uh, uh, um, have authority to deal with this. And on the right, the review of the audits. People forget what was, it, what was in their audit last month, let alone last year or five years ago. It's important to have the documentation to see what went wrong in the past and what you overcame. And that will help also new people coming into the space to see where you were before. It's a really good historical piece. And the final piece is then we were asked to to um, really identify steps to get started. So it could be, again, that packaging company as an example. You've used that, that 10 yes or no questions as a gap analysis. You start to look at the management system to say, okay, we see a system could be in place. And now how much is enough and what are our steps? So this was another one of, one of our articles. We, we basically most briefly define, start with a task force. Have an, that executive define a, a project to look at this, to define what is a, what's the recommendation for a, a strategy. Start with a broad mission statement, the scope. If you're meeting GFSI, that's meeting all types of fraud, all products. Conduct a pre-filter, that's an early assessment. Then a detailed assessment where needed. Usually you find a couple areas are the, are the worst. You'll go deeper there. Um, and then, then you wanna plot these on an enterprise risk map. This starts to identify that level of risk tolerance. Again, things like how many audits do you do on a supplier before you're comfortable? At this point, you can then, this feeds right into the enterprise risk management system. This is something that a, a risk manager or a CFO understands, and we can feed right into their decision-making system. Look at some countermeasures, just understand uh, what you might be doing and then really calibrate the final activities on the overall enterprise risk map. And at that point, then you propose, you propose the actual strategy itself. This can then go to the corporate group and explain, okay, even for that packaging company, here's what we saw, here's how we think we should deal with it, here are the activities that people need to deal with it, here's the type of capability and capacity we need in people, the training we need of people, and then you can ask for, for a yes or no. And then, from all that, do it. <laughs> you take the proposal, uh, you propose it to management. Um, note, if, if, if they don't approve any changes, then, then that's a support of the status quo. But a key is you as a manager, you as an employee, you've proposed this and uh, they've, they've made their decision whether they wanna act or not. But you've given them a very, very detailed assessment of what's needed. And you know, really the question you get back from them, or you're asking of them is, is more information needed for them to really make a decision. So with that, the, the, what we see overall is this, you know, that food fraud is, is defined as a concept. It's, it's, you know, rooted in food safety management systems now. There's a lot more um, um, really uh, uh, processes, methods, standards that are, that are rolling out. It's becoming a lot more common um, across the marketplace to hear people talk about it, to hear talk about VASIP for vulnerability assessments. The documentation for a food fraud prevention cycle, the management system, the assessments, they're, they're getting a lot more clear. And then now we're really seeing this, this demonstrate implementation as, as the last step. And so hopefully we've given you a broad perspective on putting that management system together and starting to have a real way to calibrate it. A key is calibrating your unique fraud opportunity with your unique risk assessment. So with that, we'll take uh, uh, more questions, I guess. We've had some along the way, but I'm happy to, to spend as much time with you as you like.
So, so earlier on, you presented some examples of what you'd seen in it, uh, in industry, some of the, the better well-known ones. Um, are there any ones, say, that uh, with uh, that, that you could talk about that uh, perhaps in your experience that you had to deal with? Maybe, you know, you don't want to say exactly who and stuff, but but uh, can you give any practical examples of fraud that, that you have had to work with? Sure. Well, yeah, yeah this, it's, a, it's a great question. There's, there's a lot of great ones. Pardon me. Um, well, I think that it's interesting. The key is the method, that you have a method to start to look at this. So let's say that you have a new, well, I'll go back up here to the, the food fraud prevention cycle. That's a good one to use when, you, when we look at, at, at a process. So um, one, of the thing, one question came up is, is about suppliers as they, as they come under financial pressure, like now. This is a perfect example now. So which companies, let's use that. Okay, here, here's going to be your live case study. So COVID-19 issues, supply chain disruptions right now. Which suppliers should you worry about? Well, number one, should you worry about suppliers? And one question is suppliers that are under financial duress are ones that might be enticed to mm, cut corners. Maybe, you know, are they, are, they, are they having untrained employees working on fill lines because some employees are sick? Well, for us, that, the process is the key. So what we'd look at is, is, I'd say that's kind of in scanning there on the left, that we realize that companies are under pressure and maybe different types of, of employees are, are working on, on different fill lines. So that's new information coming in. So we'll take that in to understand that. Next, we'd look at the fraud opportunity. So, boy, what would it be for that, that company? Well, maybe they would cut corn, maybe they, they'd use a lower quality meat than, than what they've used before. Now we've identified something and now we can go ahead and look at this and to say well if they did use a lower quality meat well um, you know would that how would that impact us and then we start to look we can then cycle that through the system to look at what might go wrong how, would that still would that be with, above our risk tolerance if it ends up finding out that it's above our risk tolerance then we could look at countermeasures specifically and that would be testing and so we could then go back and say okay we should probably increase our quality tests because we feel that people are going to use lower quality cuts of meat or something like that. Now you see how the cycle works. And, and at that point, then we, we'd go into more detail into, the, into those assessments and look around that. Now that's, that's implementing a quality test for, say you have five meat suppliers, then that wouldn't be a lot of tests. But really the question is not just for meat, it could be for any ingredients you buy across the entire marketplace. Well, how would you start to look at quality of every ingredient you have. If you have 500 ingredients, if you did just one test a month, that's 500 more tests. But one thing we could do is to look at what would be indicators of a company that is under pressure. So, now so, so, with, that, so, so with that, are you actually, have, are you seeing additional or the numbers saying that during the COVID-19 that there's uh, additional fraud that's going on? Is there any, any evidence that you've seen that the numbers have increased during the coronavirus pandemic? Well, that, that would actually be, at, at that point then, as you look at your products, that would be where you'd feed that in from incidents, where you'd, you'd go look specifically. Uh, so that, that would feed into the information itself. Um, I think that a lot of the investigation information is, is really very slow to get from the awareness into a public, a public marketplace. So um, there's a lot of new incidents that, are, that, that will enter into into our our knowledge but but we want to look at we want to take those to really understand more the vulnerability and what we do know is that under financial pressure that companies will you know people will, will be enticed to commit fraud yep. and and so, so so we want we take it i'm sorry go ahead yes so i so i i think your answer to that question is is that people, companies should be on the uh, on the alert because uh, during the pandemic with potential shortages and other items that it, it creates an incentive for, for initiating the food fraud, I think is, I think is what you're trying to say. Yeah. And, and um, what we want to, yeah, well, a key is that we'd like to then say process wise, strategically, what would be something common about companies that would be enticed to commit fraud? And one is if their credit scores go down. And so all of a sudden you, you have a credit, every company has a credit department. You check your customers and suppliers both to look at their credit. So you could have an automated system from credit that would feed into, there'll be information feeding in to information about if your 
suppliers or customers are slipping in their credit scores from AAA to AA, AA to A, whatever, or any types of Dun & Bradstreet's reports. And then you could, if you have 10,000 suppliers, you could have a computer that looked at all those companies that slipped. All of a sudden, you're not just looking at meat or species. You're looking at all the companies that just went from a B to a C rating. And you could then have a process that automatically testing or audits or traceability kicked up a notch if someone went below that level. Now, that could be someone that sells you pallets or something, something that's not technical, not food product at all, but it would help you look overall at the system itself. Um, another question that we got that, uh, that came up on here is, uh, um, is that uh, you mentioned the MOOC information yep. is being updated. When, when do you anticipate this to go live on your website? That's a good question. I would say probably two weeks we'll be back up. So I said, don't worry, we'll we'll have it on LinkedIn and everywhere as soon as it it, it gets back up. Um, so we're updating the MOOCs themselves as well as the the whole functionality of our learning management system. The next question we have is: Where an enterprise is practicing fraud with complete documentation falsified to hide behind, what programs exist? that will reveal this fraud. So, so basically, I guess the question is, if someone's practicing fraud, they're, they're generating false documentation, what do you do then? Yeah. So first step, it's so important to have details of an incident. This is criminology 101. You wanna go really understand the crime. That's why they go to the, they go to the crime scenes and gather the information. That would, be in, we, that would feed into incidents. So if we find, let's say that it's, there's been, there was honey smuggling uh, in, the, in the past, honey laundering, they called it. Um, and so there was a lot of documentation that was, that was uh, fraudulent. So we would then study how the bad guys got in the system and what, what did they do? Um, part of that is looking at what are the consequences for us along the way. Now, if, if the documentation is, is um, been, been fraudulent, then we realize that we can't rely on documentation at all. For, for, for that part of it. So along the way, then that would be something that would feed into our entire assessment. And that's where it would fit into countermeasures. So we'd start to then do things. And that, so all of a sudden things like with honey, what, what people did is, is mass balance. So they'd go to the manufacturer and they'd count barrels in the warehouse. They'd look at inventory coming in and going out, things like that. And it also monitor the production line. And so just the ability to go there and do that investigation or audit then put pressure on those companies to realize that you were looking. And at that point, then, then some, some of the fraudsters may back away from the business. One company that I interacted with, once they started to talk about food fraud with their suppliers, they said half of their brokers stopped bidding on their business. And um, they asked me why they, I thought that was. I said, well, I don't know specifically since I don't know your brokers. But, but you'd think if you increased a fraud, um, you know, fraud prevention plan that anybody that was committing fraud or thought they might have fraud in their products would, would stop selling, selling to you. And that's the goal. That's target hardening. That's reducing a vulnerability. That's why the whole plan's in place. You just want to make bad guys think that there's a, there's a higher chance that they're going to get caught. So, so when you're, uh, say, an individual is assembling a uh, food fraud team, in their company, kind of similar to the mindset if you're talking to food safety people is kind of like the HACCP team that they have and they have a broad uh, scope of people that are on the HACCP team like microbiologists, maintenance operations, etc. So, so in that same context, someone is assembling a food fraud team within your company. What expertise within the company would you recommend to, to be part of that food fraud team? Yeah, I see. I'll go, I'll go down here a couple slides. Uh, a, a real key is this, this first off is, is this whole task force at the start to look at the types of fraud that you have occurring. If your fraud is all stolen cargo theft, uh, when, when it leaves your facility getting stolen on the way to a supplier, then that's a very different need for business than say luxury chocolate where it might be counterfeit. Counterfeit or even, even luxury chocolate could be stolen packaging. Could be the, so they could have stolen packaging and counterfeits be, be the, the real issues. So that's a real key is that's why you do this assessment first to understand what, what, what problem you specifically have. And at that point, as you go through and, and look at this down here, um, the number six was consider the countermeasures and control systems. That's why you look at this, consider them, not make decisions, but consider them in this task force, because then you identify that that could be a lot of cargo theft focus or, or international anti-counterfeiting. Now, the other side of it, it could be all, say you're buying, um, um, from a thousand local suppliers of something in your state, 
then the fraud opportunity may be at very small farmers. And so that's, again, a very different fraud opportunity. And so you want to really understand what your problem is. And then you look at the, at the, at the, the cycle, the prevention cycle, and you identify the tasks that are going on and where there would be more of a focus. And then you can calibrate the right team. Two companies may look almost exactly alike from the outside and have completely different fraud opportunities and completely different management system needs on the inside. Okay, I think I've, I've gone through all of the questions that have been uh, uh, provided. Um, we'll give another couple moments on here if, if there's any other questions that would come up before we close it. Um, I think while, something while I, would say, I, I would <laughs> say to people, you can do this. It starts simple. Start looking at the most basic concepts. There, there's just basic basic ideas out there. It's required for your company. Um, start simple, um, and then then keep going all deep, only as deep as you need to go. And and that that's a real key. It doesn't have to be the huge HACCP system all on day one. Shouldn't be. Um, start start simple. There's also much. There's more communities of practice. That we're, that we're seeing now. And that's something I think like through IFT, that's something maybe we do do more of, of, of people getting together to talk about what they're doing and, and looking at the very, very beginning steps. Okay, I, I, I think with that, uh, I, there's no more questions that, that I've seen on the, uh, on the uh, uh, log. So, so with that, I think we'll, we'll bring the uh, 58th Tanner lecture to a close. I want to say thank you, Dr. Spink, for, for your presentation today. It was fantastic. And uh, I, I wish there was a way that I could push a button or we could hear the audience uh, clapping uh, in appreciation. Yeah. So uh, thank you for this. And uh, um, it was a very, very nice evening. Thank you all. Yes, I'll second that. Thank you very much. And have a good evening, everyone. Thank you and good night.